thank you for having me here. Um, uh, I'm delighted to uh, be able to talk to you about these topics. Um, the title and everything else I was changing up until this morning, so ap apologies that it's a little no different. Um, I was asked to uh, talk about the bioelectrics of cancer today. And so what you'll notice is that the first uh, third to almost half of the talk is developmental biology. And this is because uh, I think f fundamentally there are some really profound issues in cancer that have the roots in developmental biology. And I want to share with you some, some thoughts on this topic. If you have any other um, questions in the future, you, you, can, uh, you can find me here. So uh, uh, the whole talk summarized in one sentence basically is that uh, what I'm going to tell you is that like the brain, somatic tissues in the body communicate electrically. They form networks. And these networks, much like neural networks, uh, can make decisions. And the decisions they make are decisions about anatomy. So instead of behavior, they decide um, questions of anatomy. And that we can now target the system for control of large-scale cellular decision making and that this has many applications, I think, in cancer medicine. And I'll tell you right now that I'm gonna show you some, some uh, pretty weird looking organisms, uh, such as this five-legged frog, and none of these things are Photoshopped. These are all real, um, real animals that are alive in our lab. Okay, so the first thing I wanna talk about is uh, some, some thoughts about um, cancer bio, different ways to think about cancer biology. So this animal right here is a single cell animal called a lacrimarium. This is in real time. And you will see that as he goes around hunting for bacteria in its environment, you'll see a few things. Um, first, so, so first of all, notice the incredible control uh, it has over its uh, anatomy. So people who are into soft body robotics and things like this, we don't have anything that remotely approaches this. So this, this animal uh, controls its pattern, its physiology, and its behavior all in one cell. And the reason I'm showing this to you is because a lot of people work on the question of why is there cancer and why, why cancer happens. I think uh, another really important question is why isn't there any, why is there anything other than cancer? Because individual cells are extremely competent. So, so this guy doesn't really care about anybody else in his environment. He's going to do whatever he needs to do to survive, to proliferate. He's going to go where he wants. He's going to eat what he wants. Um, he dumps um, uh, entropy into the, into back into the environment. So the, the, the boundary of this, of this creature is right at the edge of that cell. That's all that it's concerned with in terms of measuring and managing events, that's all, all, all it's concerned with. So individual cells are highly competent. Why would these things ever get together to form a large, a large body, right? Because, because he's gonna give up a lot, if, if he's gonna become a skin cell and sit there quietly uh, uh, at the edge of an, of, a, of an organism and eventually get dropped off, you know, he, he's sacrificing quite a bit. So this issue of how these very competent cells with selfish behaviors get together is, is, is pretty important. And they do get together in a remarkable way. So this is an early, uh, early embryo with a bunch of blastomeres. And then pretty soon uh, it becomes, this is a cross section from a human torso. And you can see the uh, amazing invariant distribution of all the tissues that, that these cells have to make. And it basically does the same thing every single time. So where does this pattern actually come from? Because these, these cells, they get together and they do something very important. They have to reproduce the same anatomical structure each time during development. And then they have to maintain it during adults. So in my group, um, we uh, think about questions like uh, where anatomy comes from, how individual cell groups know what to make and when to stop, and what happens when this process breaks down as cancer. We also think about it as engineers in terms of how, how do we get these cells to build something different and then regenerative um, applications and so on. So, um, so, this is, so, so, so what's really, uh, I think, interesting to keep in mind is that pattern control is a really fundamental problem in um, uh, biomedicine. Because if we had control over large-scale three-dimensional structure, we really could have the solution to birth defects, traumatic injury, um, cancer, degenerative disease, aging, creation of synthetic living machines. Almost everything, with the exception of uh, perhaps uh, uh, infectious disease, could be handled if we really understood how to make cells build what we want them to build. So what I'm going to do today is talk to you about bodies as uh, information processing constructs that create, remodel, and repair um, complex shapes. We're gonna talk about some key knowledge gaps that I think are gonna end up being uh, very relevant to both uh, development and the, and the cancer problem. Uh, specifically, we'll talk about the bioelectric code, which is the way that information is processed electrically in cells and tissues, and then talk about some future applications. So this is development. We all start life as a single cell. This is, uh, reliably self-assembles into one of these many um, anatomies. Uh, Sometimes this process goes wrong, but um, this, this, uh, this is a teratoma, and this is very interesting to developmental biologists because in this kind of scenario, uh, this, this thing has 
teeth and, and skin and hair and pieces of bone and muscle and so on. And so cell differentiation proceeded. Okay? So, so there's no problem with cell differentiation. The problem is with the three-dimensional arrangement. So the reason this is different from that is that even though you have all your, all your uh, uh, cell types, they're not arranged in the, in the correct three-dimensional organization with each other. So this tells you that even if we understood all the mechanisms that take cells down specific lineages to form different types of tissues, that's still not the same as understanding the difference between, uh, between cancer and normal, um, normal embryogenesis. So uh, this is the sort of thing that uh, many people think about in developmental biology where it's sort of an open loop feed forward system where you have some gene regulatory networks. Some of these genes make proteins. There are some physics by which these proteins interact, uh, perhaps adhesion and, and so on. And then there's this magical process of emergence whereby lots of different cells interact uh, with each other under these rules and eventually something like this comes out. And so, so that's kind of a feed forward uh, way of looking at things. But here's something very interesting. Um, actually, patterning is not uh, an open loop system. So if you split uh, an early embryo, you don't get two half embryos, you get two perfectly normal, normal monozygotic twins. Um, so each half knows exactly what's missing and it can reproduce the missing part. You can do the opposite and you can actually smush uh, uh, embryos together at early stages and uh, you get a perfectly normal animal out the other end. So this is, this is amazing plasticity. We don't, again, have any, any artifacts uh, that behave this way. There's nothing we have that you can cut in half and you can have two, two working, uh, working copies. So beyond embryogenesis, this is regeneration. So some animals, like this axolotl, this salamander can regenerate its eyes, its limbs, its um, ovaries, its jaws, its uh, heart, and portions of the brain, um, spinal cord, and so on. Incredibly highly regenerative during its, um, during its lifespan. Here you can see what happens when you amputate a leg. So over time, exactly an indistinguishable uh, limb will appear. One of the most amazing things about regeneration, lots of people are working on how to augment regeneration in humans, let's say. One of the really critical questions is why does it stop? So this is a system that uh, has very rapid cell proliferation, all kinds of things going on, but when it finishes making a, a, a normal axolotl limb, everything gr grinds to a halt and it stops. So this is a system that knows what a proper uh, axolotl limb looks like because that serves as a stop condition to all these processes. So we really need to understand how, how that works. And uh, beyond that, there are other animals. So this is a planarian, which you'll see some uh, more information about later, but this is a flatworm that uh, actually, you can cut into many pieces, and each piece gives rise to a perfectly normal, tiny little planarian, and then they will, um, they will grow, and then you'll have many flatworms. So, so every piece, you can cut it any way you like. The record, um, uh, sometimes people wonder how small can you get. The record is about 275. And every piece knows exactly what's missing and can reproduce exactly what's needed and to restore a normal planarian. Now, right away, you see that there's some very interesting uh, decisions that have to be made. So for example, if you cut it like this, just cut it in half here, these cells will grow to make a tail, these cells will grow to make a head, so notice that you have completely different anatomical outcomes from cells that were near neighbors. They were, they were sitting right next to each other. So this is not a local phenomenon. You can't decide what you're gonna be, head or tail, just by knowing your position within the, within the animal. So um, these kind of positional information uh, models have a lot of work to do because it's not enough to know where you are. You have to actually communicate with the rest of the tissue and say, well, the head's over here and there is a head, so I have to make a tail, all these kinds of things. We need to understand how, how that works. Uh, important to know, regeneration is not just for so-called lower animals. So the human liver is highly regenerative. Deer is an amazing phenomenon, although a terrible model system, unfortunately. But um, <laughs> de I, I've, I've, so many times I've tried to, I've tried to get people to, to, to take, take this up. But um, the thing is, uh, so, so these guys, large adult uh, mammals, they regenerate. Uh, and remember, this is not a horn. This is an antler, which means true bone, vasculature, innervation, the whole thing, up to a centimeter and a half of new bone per day. Just think about that. I mean, you can almost see this growing when it's coming out. It's ridiculous rates of, uh, of, of bone growth. And of course, human children regenerate their fingertips um, and then they lose this ability somewhere between 7 and 11. So what we really have then is this kind of a feedback system where, yeah, there's this forward part, but there's actually very important feedback uh, both at the genetic and at the, at the level of physics, which is this is the one I'm going to talk to you about today, that uh, implements this sort of error detection control loop that basically when uh, some, some biological systems are deviated from their correct uh, anatomy, there are feedbacks that, that kick in that will try to reduce the error. 
and, and try to undertake cellular activity that gets back to the correct shape. So this is basically looks like a, a very simple um, homeostatic cycle. This is, we, we call this pattern homeostasis. So instead of keeping to uh, some parameter like temperature or pressure or something like that, this is a homeostatic cycle that, uh, that tries to restore correct uh, anatomical structures. And if you think about um, systems this way, then you have to uh, ask two simple questions. Number one, could we rewrite the set point? So every anatomical system has a particular set point, and can we change that set point and let the cells uh, build something different? And, and so could we, could we target this uh, kind of this, this, this computational process instead of rewiring some of this stuff? Could we, could we change the pattern to which these cells are working? So what we would like to do is, in addition to, uh, this is kind of the mainstream um, task, everybody's doing this, explain the sort of the finer mechanistic details of how cells become other cell types and so on. But really, we want to understand also the information processing that allows cells to coordinate their behavior towards a large scale goals, system level goals, tissues, organs, and so on. Um, we have some fundamental uh, gaps in our understanding here, which are not often thought about. Most of us, when, when during our lifetime, if you have a mutation somewhere in your body, this is not passed on to your offspring, okay? And so, so that sort of keeps the, the lineage um, more or less clean. Planaria do something completely different. Most planaria, uh, uh, most of the time, the, the, the planarians um, reproduce by, by fission. So they tear themselves in half, each half regenerates, and now you've got two worms. But that's an amazing thing because that's somatic inheritance. This means that mutations that you have in your body do propagate, if they don't kill the cell, do propagate to the next generation. And so in fact, planaria genomes are an incredible mess. Okay, so, so you can't even really ask how many chromosomes this animal has because they're mixoploid. Every cell has a different number of chromosomes. And, and I mean, their genomes are just an incredible mess. So um, what is that telling us about um, the relationship between genomes and anatomy if the genome can get uh, really pr pretty trashed over, five, over four to 500 million years of, of somatic inheritance, but the pattern of regeneration is perfect every single time, okay? So, so that's kind of amazing, you know, we, we don't, we, we, we t people tend to think about a pretty tight relationship between the genome and the anatomy, but um, something very interesting is going on here, and so we really don't understand at all how this is. So we're getting better at the mechanisms, but we really don't understand some of the algorithms that determine these large-scale uh, large um, structures. So the reason it's important, of course, is because this is the kind of thing we're, we're pretty good at now is, is deriving um, gene regulatory networks and so on. But what we really want to understand, predict, and control is this three-dimensional structure. And so what I think is that we're, we're getting very good at manipulating um, molecules and cells, but we're a long way off from, from understanding how to control uh, specific, um, specific patterns, and it's important. And one way to think about what happened here is that this, this, this is a very interesting picture. This is what programming looked like in the 40s, okay? And the reason this is interesting is because in order to program, she is rewiring the hardware. She is literally moving wires around because that's how you had to program back then. Now, the reason we have this amazing uh, revolution in information technology is because we went from this to machine code and now to the point where if you wanted to program, you don't need to know anything about your hardware. You may not have any idea where your hardware is. It might be virtualized. You don't know what you're running on. But what you can do is you can focus on the control algorithm. You can focus on uh, talking to your system at the level at which um, uh, you could really describe what you want it to do. And that's because computer science really understood the distinction between software and hardware. And you'll see how this theme develops in the rest of the talk. I think it's very important that what, we're, what, what most biology does now is this. We're all about the hardware. We love um, uh, rewiring a transcriptional network, single molecule uh, kind of approaches. All of that is, is interacting with the system at the level of hardware. And I think there's, there's a complementary approach which computer science took um, decades ago and which um, we, can, we can start thinking about. So, so let's think about um, cancer as an example of, of, of some of this. Uh, there are lots of different uh, views of cancer, and I'm certainly not going to argue that cancer is a single, uh, single thing. There are probably many different aspects to it. But um, this guy had an interesting quote that sort of uh, summarizes our, our view of this, that basically what he's saying is that it's not a disease of cells any more than a traffic jam is a disease of individual cars. So it's a way to think about uh, system level disorders that don't necessarily have anything to do with the mechanics of how the individual pieces do what they do. It's more of an information slash computational problem. So what I'm going to talk about is this, this idea that, that at least some cancers are a 
d developmental disease. They're almost a, uh, a disease of geometry in a sense. They're a, they're a disorder of how cells interact with the field of information that tells them what to do and keeps their activity orchestrated towards the anatomical needs of a, of a large host. And so you can... Right, so you're saying that the, in that statement, you're basically saying that cancer as a disease of communication. So this is not about cell itself, and it's about how it interacts with the next cell, the, the host, and the, so it's about how it... Yes, cell commu yes, cells communication with other cells and with their environment. So some of, the, some of the important aspects of the environment are pr is probably not cellular, but uh, you know, other types of molecules and so on. But yeah, it's, I, I would agree with that. I think, I think it is fundamentally a communication issue. Yeah, yeah. So, so you can start thinking about um, some predictions of these ideas. Uh, so for example, if we think about, um, a lot, oftentimes uh, people ask, so, so why do human bodies have reduced regenerative potential? And you know, we're, not, we're not like salamanders and so on. So, so there's two ways to think about this. If you are focused on things like cell cycle checkpoints, uh, TGF betas, and, and so on, controls at the single cell level, then what you might say is the reason we are not highly regenerative is because if you're a long-lived organism with uh, ready access to uh, the kind of proliferative cells that you would need in order to regenerate, then you'd, be, you'd, you'd have a high uh, carcinogenic load, that basically the cost of cancer over the lifespan would be too high. So in order to avoid that, we've really cranked down all those mechanisms. So in the, on that view, cancer and, uh, and regeneration should go together. That is, animals that are good at regenerating should be susceptible to cancer. There's a different way to think about this, which is which you could say, if you're focused on the morphogenetic control systems, you could say that Organisms that are actually good at uh, being plastic and controlling their, um, their anatomical structures might actually be able to resist cancer by continuously reinforcing uh, the communication with cells that makes them do whatever um, they're supposed to be doing. And so on that view, you should have uh, uh, regeneration and cancer being uh, anti-correlated. Okay? And so, so here's an example where the perspective, um, a sort of top-down versus bottom-up perspective, make different predictions. So it's not just philosophy, they make actually different predictions. And so, it turns out actually that 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 this is that this is the correct uh, the correct um, relationship. So, so uh, animals that are highly regenerative have have generally have very low incidences of cancer, and in many cases. Uh, processes like um, embryonic development and also regeneration tend to normalize or convert um, uh, uh, tumors into normal tissue. So this was shown years ago in, in salamander limbs and also in, uh, in, in mouse embryos where you can take aggressive carcinomas, stick them into an early mouse embryo, and they basically end up contributing as normal cells to the mouse. So then if you think about it evolutionarily, that means that you get to not have cancer and you get to regenerate, which seems like two good things. Correct. So why do you think there are any animals that don't have this property? Right, right. Um, so, so there are some costs to regeneration as well, and I can tell you, so nobody knows. The, the real answer is nobody knows, but I, but I can tell you, I can tell you a story about um, uh, mammals, let's say. If you are an early mammal, uh, you know, something mouse-like, you're running around the forest and um, uh, somebody bites your leg off. Problem is, you, get, you have a couple of problems. Problem number one is you're going to bleed out. You have a high, uh, high blood pressure. You are, um, you know, you, it's, uh, salamanders can sort of hang out for long periods of time, and, and you know, six months later they'll get a, they'll get a leg. So, so the mammalian version of this is you need to clot, you need to scar, you need to seal it, or you're not, you're not going to be around long enough to, to regenerate. The other thing is that unlike these animals that are aquatic, so, so most of the good regenerators are aquatic, and, and I think there are two reasons for that. One is that in, a, in, in an aqueous environment, the, the limb doesn't have to be load-bearing. You're not trying to step on it. You know, you're not going to regenerate much of a blasteme if you're constantly grinding it into the forest floor as you're, as you're walking around. The other thing is that, and actually the one example of, of mammals that are highly regenerative, the deer, it's not the legs that regenerate, it's the, it's the antlers which, which experience no pressure at all. The other thing that, um, that I think really helps about being aquatic, which we'll get to in a minute, is the fact that in water, you can more easily drive a lot of the bioelectric currents that you actually need to kickstart this. So I think what mammals have done is simply said, uh, it, it's, it's not useful enough, uh, we, we just really need to go the scarring route. And they went towards scarring, clotting, um, you know, inflammation, all that kind of stuff. So, so that's it, but, but, but the, I don't have any proof of that, that's just the story. So, so how about the aquatic mammals, like whales or dolphins, do they? That is a great question. I'm not sure anybody's allowed to check if a dolphin or a whale is regenerative, <laughs> but it might be a good, uh, that's a great question. I, I don't know, but 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 keep in mind that all of them went through a land phase, right? As, as far as I know, and so so I think they may have not regained it, or they may have. I don't but know. we know that sharks, for example, scar very well. Uh, I mean, 
mean, at least, you know, you can see pictures of sharks that have like run into other sharks and propellers and they have like, yeah. you know, their face is just destroyed. Yeah. Uh, so, and then, are there, is there something about fish? Uh, un unclear, um, unclear. Skin, is, is, you know, skin scarring is is also not the, quite the same as regeneration, and we can get we can get back to that. In in some senses, it might be easier to actually regenerate a structure than to heal um, skin, and we can we can talk later about what that might be. Um, but this is very much an open question. Nobody has any idea why regeneration is very um, sort of. Um, uh, sporadically sprinkled around. It's not like that all those simple organisms regenerate in the complex. It's really not that at all. It's, it's, there are sister species of crabs where one regenerates and one doesn't regenerate anything. It's very, very strange. Um, okay. So, um, okay. So, so, so one of the ideas then is that <clears throat> at, this, at this way of thinking about things that's, that's sort of at the center of, of, of development, regeneration, and cancer is that if it is uh, a problem of communication and not some sort of irrevocable, irrevocable defect in a specific founder cell, then what you might be able to do is reboot the patterning program, which would, the, uh, would be uh, an alternative method to, 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 to killing um, chemotherapy, which has, aside from the toxicity, it also, you, you can evolve tumor resistance, you can, evolve, you can activate a compensatory proliferation response, all kinds of things. It would be nice if we could reprogram these cells instead of having to track all of them down and killing them. So, what we're interested in then is asking, okay, so what are these signals that keep cells working towards a normal anatomy? Because if you knew what those were, maybe you could re reactivate them during, um, during instances of cancer. So we, all, all cells in the body are embedded in this, in this morphogenetic field. It's basically just a, a, the sum total of all the information that comes at cells that's um, uh, telling them what to do. And this information comes at them with, in different flavors. There's obviously chemical signals, uh, extracellular matrix, tensions, stresses, pressures, oxygen gradients, lots of different things. The one we're gonna talk about is bioelectrical. It's sort of my favorite, um, and it's just, but, but, the, but the reason I put this up here is that if I spend the next half hour talking about bioelectricity, it's not because I think bioelectricity does everything, it's because it's an important layer of a, of a, of a very complex um, informational structure. So let's talk about bioelectricity and what that is. Everybody's used to the story of neuroscience, which is that the brain consists of some hardware. Hardware uh, is basically these cells that have um, ion channels in the plasma membrane. They uh, allow each cell to acquire some resting potential. And then this may or may not get propagated to neighbors through open gap junctions. And so we've got these networks of cells that set their electrical potential as a function of um, their own and their neighbors' activity. Okay, that's, that's the hardware. The software is this, uh, what you're seeing here is, um, this is a zebrafish brain. And it's uh, the activity, the electrical activity here is uh, whatever is representing whatever it is that the fish is currently thinking about. And so there's this, um, there's this effort of neural decoding. The idea is that if we understood what we were doing, we could look at this electrical activity and extract from it computationally the cognitive state of that, of that mind, that we would know, we would know what, the, what the, um, the animal was thinking about or visualizing, and people have done this in, in animals and human subjects to some extent. And the idea is that um, we want to be able to read out the information content of the electrical activity of this tissue, okay? So it turns out that um, this is not just a story about brains. All cells do this. So all cells have ion channels. Most cells have gap junctions or these electrical synapses. And in fact, uh, you can see here, this is uh, an early frog embryo and the, and the, the pseudo coloring shows you the, the voltage gradients of all the different cells as they communicate with each other to figure out who's going to be left, who's going to be right, dorsal, ventral, anterior, posterior. And our goal is very similar. We want to understand this electrical language and figure out the, the, co the information content of these signals so that we know what, uh, what anatomical structures they're making. Okay? It's very, very pa parallel. And the reason it's parallel is because all of this stuff didn't just sort of um, emerge out of nowhere. Uh, all of the uh, uh, tricks that, that the brain has uh, evolved by speed optimizing much more ancient electrical properties that have been around since the time of bacteria. So all cells have been doing this kind of uh, information processing long before neurons showed up. So, um, so bioelectricity, <clears throat> then the kind that we're talking about is slow uh, uh, voltage changes uh, across um, uh, endogenous, uh, endogenously produced changes across tissues not rapid action potential spiking, and no external electromagnetic component. So this is not at all like what happens when you hold your cell phone up for too long um, next to your head. The, in in, in uh, developmental bioelectricity, there's no magnetic component really, and, um, and it's not external. It's all endogenous uh, phenomena. So in single, at the single cell level, already in the 70s, um, 
people understood a, a really interesting relationship, which is that if you simply plot a bunch of uh, different cell types on this axis from depolarized uh, here to hyperpolarized, you see an interesting grouping that your mature, quiescent, terminally differentiated cells tend to um, sit up here. Uh, your proliferative embryonic cells, stem cells, and cancer cells tend to live down here. And then liver is an interesting um, um, sort of in-between case, probably not a coincidence that it's the one uh, really plastic uh, regenerative organ. So this is now at the, at the single cell level. And what's interesting is that this is not just an epiphenomenon. People have shown that you can take cells uh, uh, and, 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 and alter their uh, pr proliferative and, and um, uh, plastic, uh, uh, differentiation potential by, by altering their resting potential. So you can drive cells in this direction or in that direction by controlling um, the bioelectric, sort of a control knob for, for overall plasticity. And so we developed some, um, some strategies for looking at this in vivo now to think about a large scale uh, types of things. So, here is the flank of a tadpole. Uh, it's been soaked with a voltage-sensitive fluorescent dye. Each one of these little things is a single cell, uh, a bunch of ion channels here setting the potential. And you can see what we call a VMEM pattern, so that there's an anatomical gradient between, uh, depolar between um, the, the anterior and the posterior of, uh, of the animal that shows you there's some interesting patterns. And this is one snapshot, but of course we can make movies of this and, and do this in, in real time. And then any changes in this pattern uh, is, a, uh, is a bioelectrical signal, a, a change. And these bioelectrical signals come in two flavors. One are the endogenous normal ones that are important for development. So here, this is uh, unfortunately grayscale, but you can see here what's happening. This is, this is an early embryo um, putting its face together. And <clears throat> this is one, one frame out of that movie. And what you can see is that even before all the genes come on that determine where the eyes are gonna be, the mouth, the placodes, and so on, there is a bioelectrical pre-pattern that sort of shows you where all that's going to be. And if you artificially move these domains, these, um, these, these, these areas of differential uh, VMEM, if you move them optogenetically or in other ways, the gene expression will follow and the anatomy will follow. So you can radically rearrange the frog uh, face by, by messing with this pattern. And so this is an endogenous pattern that is the normal uh, part of how the embryo lays out where its various structures are going to be on this uh, nascent um, ectoderm. Does this, okay, go ahead. Does this pattern show up if you do calcium imaging? If you do calcium imaging, you get a very different pattern. There is a calcium imaging pattern, but it's completely different. And we've, we've just started um, looking into this. The thing with this, with this pattern, the, so, so the calcium pattern is very, um, uh, very spiky. You know, it, it's fl lots of flashing. And th this is a very steady, you know, th so this is time lapsed. And so, so this, this pattern sits there for hours. So the calcium, I think, is responding to a different time scale of, of events. Um, so, so we needed, oh, did you have? Um, so I'm kind of wondering, this one seems left and right are yeah, different. Yeah, that's absolutely one true. Eye one, eye, one eye always comes first. That, that's actually true, yeah. Yeah, one, one eye comes first, yep. Uh, so, so that's an interesting question. Where do these patterns come from? So um, there are definitely channels uh, that are required for this to happen. But if you look at where the channels are expressed, they are not expressed in this pattern. So the pattern does not come from the spatial distribution of the RNA. The pattern it comes from, A, what channels are there, but B, from spontaneous symmetry breaking and self-organization of this pattern. I think Turing patterns. It's a little like that. Um, so, yeah. OK. So, so, so these are the endogenous patterns, but there's also pathological patterns. So here's an embryo that was injected with um, uh, mRNA encoding uh, various human oncogenes. Uh, this one, I, I forget if it was a, a KRAS mutation, probably. So, so what happens is eventually you will get these, these, these tumors, and eventually they'll spread and so on. But before you get this, you can already see with a voltage dye, you can already see where the cells are depolarizing. One of the first things they do when they start expressing these oncogenes is they depolarize, they shut off the gap junctions to their neighbors, and they sort of uh, uh, revert back to this almost unicellular past where if they're, if they're uncoupled with the rest of the animal, then they treat the rest of the body as just environment. They go where they want, they proliferate as much as they want. It's really in a computational sense, it's a shrinking of the, of the boundary of the self. It's a, it's a weird way to think about it, but I think it's helpful because otherwise all of these cells normally are responding to cues about things much bigger than themselves. They're trying to maintain muscle, you know, um, muscle chevrons or, or blood vessels or something else and are constantly being told what to do to maintain this, this large scale structure. These, these cells are only going to uh, uh, worry about themselves from now on. They're only going to measure and act on things in their own uh, immediate, uh, immediate environment and they're going to start to 
uh, uh, leave, you know, leave this area and go somewhere else and proliferate as, as much as they can. So. It's the gap junctions. So, yeah. so it's the gap junctions. So it's a loss of gap junction connectivity. Oh. Oh. So, so, the, so the f first physiological and eventually transcriptional. So eventually they will actually change their transcriptional profile. But the first thing they do is that the existing gap junctions just shut down. And you can see this directly with dyes. You can put in small fluorescent dyes, and you can just see, uh, you can just see that that they've stopped communicating with the rest of the, the rest of the animal. Well, nothing is nothing is direct as far as I know. There, there's there are some steps in between, but it's it's um, it, it's direct in the sense that it's it's very re strong and reliable. It's not direct in the sense that uh, I, I don't believe the KRS protein itself, you know, sort of binds the gap junction. I think there's some stuff in between, but but yes, that's exactly what happens. So the, so these these uh, so and we we've looked at a variety of, of oncogenes, and and it's a kind of a common factor. They all they all just shut shut it down. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure quite how to ask this, but the gap junction has two sides, right? There's yeah. the cancer yeah. and there's yeah. the environment. Yeah. Could it be that the environment is cutting off the gap That's junction? That's a great question. Think? That's a great question. Hang, hang on to that. Um, for about five minutes, we're going to get into um, uh, non-local effects here. So that, that's entirely possible. Yeah. So okay, so so I want to um, briefly show you some tools that we use uh, because because one of the things uh, people uh, often people are unfamiliar with how one studies these bioelectrical signals. So the first thing we do is uh, we have ways of tracking this with voltage dyes, and of course now there's um, uh, uh, genetically encoded uh, voltage reporter proteins and so on. So you want to be able to track these states. Then we do a lot of quantitative simulation. So we have a particular tool that has been developed. Um, uh, that I'll mention towards the end that allows us to take the knowledge of which ion channels and pumps are expressed in a particular cell and to figure out, well, okay, well, what is the resting potential going to be then, right? And it's a very non-trivial um, non thing. And then really important are the functional tools. So if we have some sort of network of non-neural cells here, we basically can do one of two things. We can control the topology of the network. So we can take these gap junctions and either genetically or pharmacologically, we can, we can either close them or open them, introduce new ones, and put in mutants of gap junctions. So, so we can control which cells talk to which other cells. Or we can uh, control directly the electrical uh, state of individual cells. So again, with drug blockers or putting in new channels or optogenetically, we can control the individual state of these cells. So, so in neuroscience, this is roughly equivalent to um, synaptic and intrinsic um, plasticity that we can, we can control. I was going to show you a couple of examples of, of why this is important and uh, sort of warm up the idea that, that these, these electrical communications actually matter. So one thing we discovered long ago is that because, and eventually we discovered that, that um, Danny Adams and, and my group discovered this electric uh, face phenomenon, we found out that um, if you, ex if you uh, simply express a, a variety of ion channels in uh, regions of the embryo that are going to give rise to, to tissues outside of the head. So here are some cells that are going to give rise to this gut, and we throw in some KV1.5 channel. Uh, remarkably, this, this portion of the gut now forms an eye. And this is pretty, pretty amazing for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, it was thought before, based on uh, experiments with the uh, master eye gene, PAC6, that only tissues up here in the anterior and erector room were competent to become eye. So that's not true. You can make eyes out of almost anything. We've made eyes in spinal cord. We've made eyes out of, um, uh, you know, gut. Um, and so, so that's pretty interesting. It's not really thought that, um, that endoderm is supposed to be able to make eyes. And uh, the other thing that's interesting, and, and by the way, if you section these eyes, they have all the same tissue layers that you would expect, lens, retina, all that stuff. Uh, the other thing... They are, they are functioning, uh, that, that's a whole separate thing we can talk about. We've done, we've done a whole study of, um, of plasticity, of brain plasticity, and it turns out that you can put eyes on the tail of a tadpole of, that's otherwise blind, and that animal will absolutely see out of that eye. So the, the brain, the plasticity is amazing. The brain, the brain um, that evolved for millions of years to expect visual input from this part of the body can suddenly say, yeah, there's this weird itchy patch of tissue on my tail. I know what that is. That's visual data. And, and just do color you know, uh, recognition and, and, and um, image. Well, you know, they have some image forming ability. It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, yeah. But the other thing that's pretty cool about this is that notice the modularity here. In other words, what we did not have to do is go in and, and, and micromanage the, the construction of the eye and to say, okay, I want some lens here, I want some optic nerve here. We don't know how to do that. We have no idea how to do that. So, you know, if, so, so, so what's interesting to me is that this is, this is a, a very modular effect that you can basically 
ba basically what I think we found is, is almost like a subroutine call of saying build an eye right here. And there's a particular state that induces eye formation. The animal already knows how to make an eye. And you really don't need to know all the steps of how it happens in order to trigger this. And another example of that is here the planaria. You've got your head and tail. Here's the middle fragment. The middle fragment has a very interesting bioelectrical gradient that tells it where the head and the tail are supposed to go. And if you go and depolarize this end to match that end, these cells will happily decide that they need to now make a head, and now you have this two-headed animal. And again, we didn't have to go in and say, oh, here's how you build a planarian head and you need 17 different cell types. We, we have no idea how to do that. But what you can do is specify where the particular uh, uh, things go. So what's interesting to me about this is that we clearly, uh, uh, there's clearly a way to specify pattern at the level of organs. So this is not individual cell information. We're not controlling the differentiation of individual cells. We're actually specifying um, organ level information. And so this is a system that actually has ways to, to interpret organ level, um, organ level specification. So there are, I know there's electric fields in stuff like chick embryos as well, which mm -hmm. I don't think mm -hmm. is very like planaria. If you disrupt those electric fields during the growth of the egg, you get a weird chicken? Oh yeah, you can absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So, so people have, so, so bioelectricity has very rich history. People have been, have been thinking about this stuff for, for um, well over 100 years. Thomas Hunt Morgan has experiments in bioelectricity from 1902 or something like that. So um, what people used to do is back, back in the day when we didn't have um, all the uh, fine scale control over the, over the voltage gradients, people would, would do one of two things. They would either apply electric fields to living systems or they would shunt um, native fields. In both of those, and chicken was a popular model. So in both of those cases, absolutely, you can, um, by applying fields, you can, for example, um, flip dorsoventral polarity of the early chick embryo. So Claudio Stern did that in the 80s. Or by, by shunting uh, the existing field in the limb or the tail, you can prevent both of those structures from having normal morphology. The problem is the control, the control that you have by manipulating the actual electric field is pretty low. So, so it's a sledgehammer. You can, you can screw things up, but it's really hard to do anything like this. This, this stuff basically is only possible because we now have control over the VMEM gradients, which is very hard to do with electrodes. Electrodes are just not a great um, uh, modality for this. Yeah. So I was thinking, so, so, so what is the organizing principle of the, the bioelectric field? I was thinking about the brain, right? So we yeah. have different circuitry, and then they know how to talk to each other, and they just don't really know how exactly they interact, but at least we can dissect it that way. Do you think there are some network? Yes. Okay. Yes, so, yes. How are they so yeah, so 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 that would be another another hour of a talk. So I didn't bring all that stuff, but I'll give you I'll give you a rough um, a rough idea. So we have we have two levels of analysis that we've been doing, um, and one is to simply make a computational model of a non-neural electric tissue. And if you do that, and so Adam Cohen certainly has done that, and and we are now doing it, you know, for for these kind of cases, what you see is that there are absolutely um, uh, system level rules about how electrical patterns break symmetry, how they propagate how you establish boundaries, the size control, all of these, these kinds of things. The other way to think about it, which we're also doing, is if you think about what people have done in computational neuroscience in terms of artificial neural networks. So you have this field of ANNs where you can actually, you have this whole, all these ideas of connectionism where you can sort of say, okay, here's how we train a neural network, here's how the information is represented, here's the fact that the intermediate layers progressively abstract from the input, and people have done this in a retina and various other places. So what we are doing, and I have a postdoc who's done some very nice work on this, um, which is submitting it next month, his, his first uh, work on this, is this idea that you can actually take all the, the, the basic results of connectionist uh, thought and abstract it away from neurons. There's really nothing neural about any of that stuff. And you can relax a lot of assumptions that are typically made in those kind of networks as far as topology and various other things. And what you can show is that similar methods of storing memories, learning, training, um, prop you know, reducing error, you know, error minimization, um, all of these kind of logic gates, you can make logic gates, all of these kinds of things are easily implementable in non-neural bioelectric networks. So there are, much like in the brain, there are multiple levels. You can, you can track the physiology in great detail and just to see waves propagate and so on. Or you can ask, what's the computational function of this thing? And you can actually see pattern recognition. I mean, he, built, he literally built a pattern recognizer out of these non-neural um, networks, which is very important because question number one is, the, the axolotl has been damaged 
how does it know if the pattern's correct or incorrect? It has to be able to compare. So, so function number one is to be able to compare one sort of set of data to another set of data and say, oh, how far off are we and can we minimize that distance? So you can actually build that fairly easily, it turns out. Yes. So we know that this connects with that. Yes. But here, if they, I mean, they don't make a long range connection. So what is the structural basis for yeah. that kind of connection? Right. So, so one of the things you can do, and I'll show you a screenshot from this um, simulation platform. But, but we have a simulation platform where you have a two-dimensional tissue, and you can load in whatever ion channels you think it has, and then just say go, and it will sort of just model whatever, whatever's going on. One of the things you can ask it to do is to show you all the gap junction connections. And if you do that, what you'll find out is that there's a lot of regionalizations. So, so that's true. We don't really have, although even that's not quite right. Some, some cells do. There are these tunneling nanotubes. I don't know if you've seen the stuff that reach. Eh, they, so, so some cells make these really weird projections. They're, they're extensions of the cell membrane that have one gap junction at the, en at the end. It's like a tube. And, and it reaches, I think, maybe on the, level, on the scale of like 10 cell diameter, something. so not super long. But, but, but I don't think any of that is necessary. I think that's icing on the cake. I think the important part is that even in a sheet of, uh, a flat sheet of cells where every cell is only next to its neighbors, what you see is that there are long range gap junctional paths. And I'm going to show you some long range data in a minute to show how the information actually gets across. But basically, what you will have is these paths, they're less, they're, they're much less um, linear than, than in a typical neural network. But I'm not even sure how linear that is between the astrocytes and everything else, right? Like, I don't, I'm not sure how, how linear that, that, that classic um, thing is anyway. Okay, so, so, so moving forward with this modular idea, we're very interested in regenerative medicine. So we, were, we took this frog, unlike a salamander, the frogs regenerate either nothing or a hypomorphic spike. So 45 days later, here you see at this stage, you see nothing. And then what we were able to do is design a cocktail that we apply that would basically trigger a leg regeneration program here. And what you see is that um, you, you upregulate some, uh, some MSX1 here at the wound, you start growing a leg, and this leg is touch sensitive and motile, so the animal can, can feel and can use that leg. And eventually you get a pretty, pretty, uh, pretty, pretty good leg here. Um, this is an early, unfortunately this process takes months, and so people love taking early pictures of this because nobody wants to wait nine months to, to get to the end. So you can see this leg is pretty short, but eventually it grows, and you've got, um, you've got a toenail and some toes. Um, so, so, so we're in the process now with uh, David Kaplan, our collaborator, of uh, trying to transition this to mammals. So he makes these bioreactors that are basically going to provide an aqueous, almost amniotic-like environment for these wounds. And then our job is to, so, so he makes the devices, our job is to come up with a cocktail of uh, ion channel drugs to get this to happen. So stay tuned for that. I don't have a mouse leg to show you yet, but um, hopeful. So, so another thing we've done is to use this uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, the, in the sort of uh, field of uh, trying to repair um, birth defects. And I only have one slide of a very long project, but the bottom line is that Remember that electric face pattern that I showed you? So there's a similar pattern for the brain. So if you look down at, at, at how the brain develops, there are very specific bioelectric patterns that tell you where the edges of the brain are going to be. And many things that screw up brain development, like teratogen, so alcohol, think fetal alcohol syndrome, you know, nicotine, these na nasty things that, or, or in fact mutations in important genes like notch. One of the first things that happens is those, those bioelectric patterns get, get perturbed. And so what we did was we built a, um, um, this was uh, the work of uh, Vaipov Pai, who's a staff scientist in our group, and Alexis Pytak, our collaborator. They built a computational model of these, uh, of, of these electrical patterns, and they asked a simple question. When these patterns get messed up by these various drugs or, or, or mutations, what can we do to put them back to normal? Okay, and it's a very non-obvious thing because a lot of these channels, as you all know, are, there's complex gating, voltage gating, and so everything is, is sort of non-linear. It's very hard to know what to do, but the, the simulation handles it. And you can ask the question of what would be an intervention that would get the bioelectric pattern back to normal? So the amazing thing, and so, and so uh, it, it gave us some, some options. We then went, so it said, okay, if you misexpress this particular channel or, or open this other channel, things will, the pattern will correct itself. We went and tried it. Um, uh, really remarkable uh, when these models produce something that actually uh, can, can works on something so complex. So this is what a tadpole brain looks like in the normal case. Here's the forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain. Here's a tadpole that's expressing a dominant notch mutation. So as you would expect, the brain is all screwed up. So the forebrain is gone, the midbrain is a bubble, the hindbrain is a big mess here. And despite the fact that the notch mutation is there, 
you can get a pretty normal brain structure, brain uh, gene expression, and behavior. So, so what we do is we measure IQ by um, training them on, on a behavioral aspect. Yeah, tadpoles have an IQ. And, uh, and you can actually measure. So, so the ones with these kind of defects have basically a zero IQ. They learn nothing. These guys are put back to normal performance simply by reinforcing that uh, particular bioelectric pattern. So the important part, so, th so this is really critical because um, the early days was basically see what you can mess up, right? The idea was that yeah, we have these patterns and if we screw up the bioelectrics, things go wrong. Okay, I mean, that's nice. But what we now have that's a lot, uh, a lot more um, important than that is the computational uh, portion of this is now sufficiently good that we can actually take a case of, of damage and fix it so that we're back to a very normal structure. So I think that's, that's a really important step um, for, this, for this whole effort is to, go, is to go beyond showing that these things are, are necessary to actually develop uh, a, a, a effective interventions. Are these all fixed points in the, in the voltage space? Um, t t temporarily. So they are for some amount of time. The thing with development is you wait long enough, everything's going to change anyway. But, but on, the, on the correct time scale, yes, these are things. What you want to do is you want to push it. There are attractors for specific uh, patterns, and you want to push the system. So that's why the, comp the, the modeling is so important, because you want to understand where those attractors are and what you need to do, what are they going to be stable to, uh, and, and so on. OK, so, 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 so what we've talked about is that a lot of important information is generated um, f at the physiological level, sort of on the fly. And that um, manipulating some of this, uh, and 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 you know, mind you, uh, we could we could talk for many hours about other other data that that, that suggests this. Uh, manipulating the electrical decision making gives you some some really uh, pretty pretty amazing control over growth and patterning that would be very hard to duplicate with uh, competing approaches such as specific uh, growth factors and things like this. So so now um, so now I want to show you some of the cancer specific um, some of the cancer specific issues. So um, basically, uh, I'm, I'm just going to show you very quickly uh, three, three stories. And I'm going to show you that bioelectrical signatures could be a diagnostic tool that you should be able to induce cancer-like phenotypes just by modulating these gradients. And I'm going to show you some uh, suppression or repair. Um, and just very quickly to say that uh, ion transporters are continuously being... Um, Channels and pumps are being implicated in cancer, so there's now a number of these that are considered to be oncogenes. And you can see here in these uh, in these databases, like this geo database, you could see what happens to certain channel expressions as something moves from from normal to 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 malignancy. But I want to. I want, and, and some people, there's people that are very excited about this, and people that are using uh, this kind of uh, profiling to try and uh, fish out uh, channels that they consider drug targets. Okay, the problem is um, that you can't think of these things in the way that you would a transcription factor or a growth factor. These these channels they open and close post translationally as a function of uh, the cell physiology. So you can't merely look at this and say, oh well, the malignant version has it off. So what I want to do is turn it on here. M maybe, but maybe not. It, you you can't. It's not as simple because these things are not handled at the level of transcription. It's the physiological state, not the presence of the protein, that's important. So there's some. Uh, there's some, some issues with that. We have to really deal with the, with the physiology. So, um, so, so here's what a frog tumor looks like. Here you can see it's attracted some blood vessels. Uh, that you can see the, 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 the blood going. And so, so basically, um, I've already shown you this. You can use uh, bioelectric dyes to, know, to um, determine where these, kind of, uh, these kinds of things are, gonna, um, are going to take place. And so there are some obvious uh, applications for uh, diagnostics and... Um, uh, modalities to try to visualize tumor margins, maybe during surgery, maybe as you know, look for precancer on the skin and so on. So um, the next story I want to tell you about has to do with how can you, you can induce cancer without oncogenes, without DNA damage, without carcinogens. So um, here's a, a, a neural crest cell from Xenopus. One of the things that these guys make is melanocytes or pigment cells. And here's what normal pigment cells look like right here, and so they're absent from these periocular regions, but you, there's a small number of these. And what we found is that there's a specific population of cells in the embryo that if you disrupt their electrical communication with their neighbors, one of the things that happens is these melanocytes, which apparently depend on signals from these other cells, go completely crazy. You can see what happens here when you do that. And we do this of, of, with, a, with a, you can do this either with a misexpression of a channel or a drug that opens um, this glycine-gated chloride channel. And 
these cells, they overproliferate, so you can see there's way more of them. It, they, they migrate into these areas that are normally pretty clear. It's an MMP-dependent uh, process, like you would expect from, from metastasis. And well, this is what they look like. So here's, here's the cross-section through a tadpole. Here are normal melanocytes, small number of uh, nice round little melanocytes. This is what transformed melanocytes look like. You can see here they've got these crazy long projections. It's because they're trying to uh, dive into, they, they, they invade the neural tube, they invade the lumen here, uh, try to get into the brain. They get all into the, um, the blood vessels here. I mean, it's basically melanoma. And remember that, that there's nothing genetically wrong with these animals. So now, if you sequence this or you look for markers, eventually they turn on slug and, and snail and all these things that you would expect to see in, in melanoma. But originally, there's nothing, wrong with, there's nothing wrong with any of these cells per se. All that's happened is a one particular ion channel has left them unable to communicate with these instructor cells. There's also a, um, a blood vessel phenotype that you can see here. Um, and so the interesting thing here is to keep in mind is, and this starts to get at what you were asking before, and I'll show you some more data on this. Keep in mind that the cells that were electrically targeted are not the cells that responded. So here in, in this, in this uh, blue um, lineage dye, these are the cells that were, that were targeted. These up here are the cells that, that transform. This is a long range signaling event. Um, I don't have a lot of time to go into it, but it happens to be serotonergically mediated. We took apart this whole thing. It has to do with, uh, with, with serotonin and, and so on. There's a lot of, a lot of um, uh, actual detail about how that works. But this is, this is a non-cell autonomous effect. So what happens electrically in one region has a lot of um, implications for what cells do in another region. I'll show you more of that in a moment. So, and so, so then we come to the opposite. We said, okay, well, if, if, if the disruption of these electrical signals is sufficient to trigger this, this metastatic phenotype, can we do the opposite and suppress or reprogram cancer uh, by restoring normal electrical properties? So what we would do is we would inject um, human oncogene RNA and co-inject uh, various ion channels to try to get, force the cells to remain, uh, to remain at normal VMEM. And what you see here, this is just one example. We did this for KRAS, for, for uh, REL3, for Glee, and so on, P53. Basically, normal cells, and, and, the, and the oncogene is red tagged, okay? So, so the red tagged cells are giving you these tumors, but it, even though the two, in the case where you co-inject a particular channel, even though the cells are expressing the, the oncogene quite strongly, there doesn't have to be a tumor here. And it's a very significant suppression effect. If you force the, the electrical properties of these cells with a completely exogenous channel that the oncogene um, doesn't, uh, doesn't know how to, how to turn off, it happens to be a constitutively active one, then you can, you can uh, maintain normal physiology. And even though, uh, even though you've got this, this oncogene, you will not have a, a tumor. So this is, this is another important area where the sort of genetic information diverges from what the actual phenotype is. Because if you sequence this thing, you will find the, um, the oncogenic mutation, and you will make a prediction that you're going to have a tumor. And actually, you, can't, you won't know the right answer until you, you actually profile the physiology. So it's very important that you can't predict these just by uh, protein or transcriptional um, profile alone. And so we've done this now also with optogenetics. So you can put in various optogenetic channels. And again, uh, depending on how you light it up, you can suppress, uh, suppress tumor genesis and so on. So um, really to, to, to drive this home, uh, this idea of this dissociation between the outcome and the, and, the, and the genetics, here's an example where we basically we introduce a particular sodium channel. And depending on how much actual sodium we put into the medium, you will either get a tumor, this really invasive thing, or you will get an ectopic eye structure. And the difference between whether or not you get a tumor or an eye is literally the amount of sodium in the water. That's all. So, so that, you know, that's a very like, like simple um, demonstration that the outcome is not uh, necessarily dictated by, in, in both cases, the channel is exactly the same. And, so, and, and of course, there's no DNA damage anywhere here. So um, to start to close up, I'm just going to show you a few, a few things where I think this is going. Um, here, here's again this this theme of uh, and, and uh, this 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 theme of, of g genome versus versus outcome that I think is very important. And the reason I harp on all this stuff is just to underscore how important this physiological layer is that sits in between the, the genetics and the and the anatomy. So so here's our here's our two-headed worm that I showed you. And one of my students asked a, a, a simple question in um, uh, 2009 or so. Uh, well. So, so you've got this two-headed worm, and you wait a couple weeks, the drug is gone within 48 hours. You wait a few weeks, and then 
what we're going to do is we're going to remove this, uh, this ectopic head. We're going to remove the primary head. We're going to leave just the nice normal gut um, that has no, uh, no brain at all. Uh, whatever we ep epigenetically reprogrammed or whatever for this ectopic head, that's gone. The, 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 there's no genomic editing that took place, so surely this thing would make a normal embryo, a normal uh, worm rather. And so, because in theory, the genome sets the, that sets the structure, so let's, let's do that. And the reason I'm showing this to you is because that's not at all what happens. What happens is that when you do this, what, these worms are in perpetuity two-headed, permanent, permanent, okay? And so, so think about what this means. Um, again, you sequence these guys, all you're going to get is a normal Degesia japonica genome. There's nothing wrong with their, with their genomic sequence. The information about how many heads they're supposed to have is a property of an electrical circuit that has at least two states, probably more. So far, we found two one-headed or two-headed, and you can flip them back and forth, and we know how to, we can take this guy and put him back to one-headed because it's a kind of electrical memory circuit. It basically just holds that information, um, and there's other components that we now know about cytoskeletal structures and, and, and planar polarity and so on that uh, are, are driven by these changes, and you can set it back and um, back and forth, and so there's a, and so it's very important to note that a transient change in this bioelectric network state can drive a permanent re-specification of the shape to which this animal regenerates, okay? Um, and the idea is that this target morphology, the shape to which it regenerates, can be stably rewritten. So some of this important information is not stored at the genomic level. And so, so I, only, I, I show you this as an example of why we should be really targeting the physiological um, layers. So, I think that um, cancer is not only a genetic disease, but also a disorder of pattern regulation, which takes place at the level of physiology. Uh, these bioelectric properties can be used to detect, induce, and reprogram neoplastic cell behavior, at least uh, in the models that we've looked at. We are now moving all this to, to, to mammalian cells and so on. We'd like to do a lot more of that. Um, and, uh, and, and I want to talk for, for just a minute about these pharmacological strategies. So, so this is our, this is uh, just some snapshots of our simulator. This was the first, uh, the first paper that came out. She, um, uh, Alexis Pytak made this amazing system. This whole thing is free. It's freely downloadable. You can, you can, uh, you can get it and play with it, but it's, a, it's an incredible uh, simulator of all, this, of all this bioelectrics. And you can now start to ask these questions of how the different regions do or do not communicate with each other and so on. And to once again talk about this long range, um, and, and you were saying you know, how things are connected, here's, a, here's a, a functional example of that. Here's a frog, a froglet actually, still got its tail. What, what uh, my student did was amputate one of the legs because she wanted to look at the bioelectrical signaling that was involved in regeneration uh, or not uh, of this leg. But what she noticed was that the opposite leg, within 30 seconds, the opposite leg that you never touched, undamaged, would light up exactly the same kind of signal at about the same level of where the cut was. So within 30 seconds, the opposite untouched leg finds out where the damage was and what kind of damage, because you can actually recover from, from looking at the signal. You can recover information about whether it was a stab wound or a cut wound or what it was. So it, that, that information propagates centimeters across, and it does so at a, it's a very interesting speed. It's, it's, and actually, so, so we know it's not um, neural because you can take out the spinal cord all here and it still gets across, so it's not neurally mediated. It's, it's slower than what neural conduction would be, but it's way faster than what diffusion would be. Okay. Does it work like it's some sort of template? So that's a that's a great question. Yeah. Yeah. We were thinking about why. Okay. So why does the uncut leg need to do this? And there's a couple of options. One option is that uh, it's it's using this as a template of what it's going to do for regeneration. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that this leg is getting ready on the theory that something just bit off one leg. Uh, it's part, it might still be around. So is there anything we could do to make life better if he does decides to bite the other leg? So that's that, you know I mean that's a, that's a hypothesis. We have no idea if that's if that's right. So we're still we're still you know this is this is just a few months ago we um, we published this. I see. I see. Yeah, could well, could well be. Could well be. Um, yeah, it could well. Yeah, we don't. We don't know. But one thing this one thing this offers the opportunity of doing is uh, surrogate site monitoring. So the idea is, if we didn't have access to what was going on here, could we look at another part of the animal and figure out what was going on? Right? How much can you tell from looking at one portion and another? And we have all kinds of um, experiments. Uh, Oh yeah. 
but slower than neural transmission. Correct. Like, like electric yeah. transmission. Which makes perfect, it makes perfect. So, so you think it's uh, so gas junctions? Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's my guess right now. There's a couple of things we need to rule out first. The one thing we haven't done is rule out blood flow yet. We have to take out the heart and make sure that it's not vascular, you know, blood mediated. I, I, I don't think it is, but we have to prove that. But yeah, uh, we, we, th we think based on that and, and various other um, persistence we've dealt with, we, we think it's, it's propagation of, of slow, um, slow waves through the gap junctional field across. Well, we're looking at the electric signal, which we, or we were looking at the membrane. Yes. The polarization the yes. Signal. So why do we, if it's a gap junction event, why do we not see a gradient across? It seems like there's something, nothing. Right, right. The propagation, because, because the propagation itself might be, it might be pulsatile, it might be calcium, it might be um, uh, 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 like a um, uh, relay kind of thing. We don't, we don't know yet what is going through. So, so it's not necessarily that it's voltage itself that's going through. It could be small second messengers. It could be, I'm pretty partial to serotonin because it keeps propping up. It could be things that we can't see yet, but by the time it gets to where it's going, it gets converted to, that, that's what we think okay, right so now. Absolutely not. In fact, in fact, one of the most common ways that bioelectrics, so in all these different projects, we always have to find out how does the voltage change talk to the nucleus. You have to transduce the voltage change. And sometimes it's calcium. About a third of the time, it's, it's through serotonin. So it's, it's voltage-dependent movement of small molecule messengers. Sometimes it's butyrate. That's a cool one because that comes from bacteria, and we have a couple of stories now about bacteria being part of the electric circuit. The, bacteria, the endogenous microbiome actually is part of the electric circuit. And, and regulates what happens uh, downstream. So absolutely, um, chemical relays are part of this. That's what makes this whole system much slower than, than, than you know, pure, pure neural. Um. So, <clears throat> so one of the other interesting things that we discovered about this, um, the bioelectrics, is, is that w we saw this and we said, boy, you know, this works at quite a distance. What happens if we, if we put the tumor RNA on this side, but we put the hyperpolarizing channel all the way over here? And you can see that even there, even that way, it has a, an important effect on reducing the number of actual tumors. So you can, and, and now we understand, we didn't understand why before, but we actually now have quantitative models that show how bioelectric states propagate across these large distances so that it's not, you don't even have to treat the actual tumor cells themselves. The environment is really important. And so what you're saying about the environment shutting off that communication, that, that's absolutely part of it. And so we're now designing these um, sim simulated um, systems to try and uh, basically understand how we can target that. Uh, so this is just something I said before, is that it, because these channels are opened and closed post-translationally, I mean, neuroscience is pretty obvious that, that you don't need changes in gene expression to, to, to run uh, bioelectrical states, but that's, it's really critical for, for, for the cancer biology field to understand this, that ion channels are not cancer genes in the sense that some of these other um, types of genes are. It's the physiology that matters, and you can't see this on transcriptional or um, uh, proteomic profiles. And so what we're doing now is we're basically building a computational platform where we take all of the existing ion channel expression data so that we know what channels are in whatever tissue you're interested in. We, from the experiments, we should know what voltage pattern is, is appropriate. And then you can use the simulator to say, okay, well, given the targets you have and given the pattern you want, what channels do you need to open and close? And then you should be able to design a cocktail. The reason that um, you need a simulator for all this is that not only is this all very complicated, you need to satisfy a bunch of criteria. For example, well, you better not stop the heartbeat. So, so right, so there's a bunch, of, a bunch of cells that you really don't want to mess with. So you really need a, a pretty good um, a, a computational component here to identify a cocktail of, of channel um, drugs that, that are going to give you what you want. And so we've been, we've been developing these kinds of uh, uh, machine learning tools that will take various networks that contain both bioelectric and chemical um, uh, nodes and search for that needle in a haystack intervention, and then this is this is uh, we we you know we 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 did some of these things to pr like predict um, ways to suppress uh, that uh, uh, metastatic phenotype that I showed you. So, so I think we're looking at a bunch of uh, directions, such as uh, trying to refine this physiological signature, trying to refine these control methods for mammalian systems. We've done some some things in human cells in vitro and and some mouse work. But uh, really, that's kind of a lot of the future of, of the next few years, and, and really try to um, crack this, uh, this bioelectric uh, uh, code um, that goes from the electrical state of the tissues to the actual outcome. And so obviously, we'd love to, to work together with more. And so um, just to um, uh, uh, thank uh, all the various, uh, uh, the various postdocs and, uh, and the grad students that worked on this. Uh, so uh, let's see, uh, Daniel Lobo was our computational guy that did some of the predictive work. Brooke Chernet um, worked on the cancer suppression. 
Uh, Maria Lobikin worked on the, cancer, uh, the metastatic induction. So Pi uh, does the uh, brain repair stuff. Um, Doug Blackiston did a lot of the, uh, the eye work. Uh, Fallon Durant uh, was the one who did the two-headed uh, planaria uh, experiments, and Danny Adams uh, developed some of the early dye, um, dye experiments. And of course, um, I thank my funders, the Paul Allen uh, Frontiers Group, and uh, various, uh, various other people who um, have helped us do this work, DARPA, um, Keck Foundation, and so on, uh, Templeton, Mathers, and of course, NIH. And then uh, if you're ever wondering how, uh, what the two-headed animals look like, this is what they look like. So, yeah. So, so if you cut off the two heads, uh, what you will get is uh, each individual head will grow a tail, and uh, but the, the middle fragment will go will head, grow two heads. Okay. So you'll get two single heads and one double head from each of those cuts. Yeah, yeah. So thank you. I'll take questions.